$20 million is more money than these people have ever dreamed of. These people don't dream about being rich. They dream about being able to watch their kids swim in a pool without worrying that they'll have to have a hysterectomy at the age of 20. By the way, we had that water brought in special for you folks. The health of an ecosystem is important for many reasons. First and foremost, it is essential that water used for consumption and bathing is clean. It is also important that food products such as crops and animal products are free of toxins, which all starts with the maintenance of a clean environment. Because water is cycled through ecosystems in such large amounts, if it is contaminated, it can have widespread ecological effects, the most notable of which is a decrease in biodiversity. These effects are not simply limited to aquatic ecosystems, but to terrestrial ecosystems as well. A great example of these wide-reaching effects can be seen in the case of Southern California town of Hinckley. The residents of this town had unusually high incidences of cancer and fertility problems, and it was due to the work of Erin Brockwich that the root cause of all these problems was traced back to the groundwater. She found abnormal levels of hexavalent chromium, and traced its source back to the Pacific Gas and Electric Company that had recently started using chromium as a corrosion agent for their cooling towers. Due to their improper disposal at one location, the pollution quickly became widespread due to the cascading effect of water throughout the ecosystem. There was a loss of biodiversity due to widespread death of flora and fauna in addition to the detrimental health effects suffered by the residents who were drinking the water, cooking with it, bathing with it, and swimming in it. This is just one of the many examples that demonstrates the need to not only monitor ecosystems, but to protect their integrity. There are three components to ecological health, ecological stability, resilience, and integrity. Ecological stability in this context is defined as the ability of an ecosystem to resist the effects of destabilizing factors, such as an increase in pollutants or an increase in turbidity due to soil erosion. Ecological resilience is defined as the ability of an ecosystem to return to its previous state after exposure to a destabilizing factor. While these are aspects of ecological health, it is necessary to consider the integrity of the ecosystem in order to determine the health of the ecosystem as a whole, since a stable and or resilient ecosystem could exist in unhealthy conditions. Ecological integrity is defined as the ability of an ecosystem to support a community with biodiversity and functional organization that is similar to other natural habitats in the same region. In East Sub-Saharan Africa, the fishery ecosystem at Lake Victoria is suffering from a severe reduction in biodiversity due to the introduction of an invasive species, overfishing, eutrophication, and pollution. Further destabilizing factors have little to no effect on Lake Victoria in its current state, and it can therefore be classified as a stable and resilient ecosystem. However, it cannot be classified as a healthy ecosystem due to its severely impaired biodiversity and its divergence from the natural variation observed in similar ecosystems in the surrounding region. This is an example of an ecosystem where determining health based on stability and resilience alone would lead to an incorrect classification in its health status. Common indicators of ecological health are flow rate, turbidity, carbon dioxide levels, pH levels, dissolved salt levels, conductivity, levels of inorganic nutrients, dissolved oxygen content, fecal bacteria, and benthic flora and fauna. A moderate flow rate is of primary importance to ecosystem health because it is responsible for cycling of nutrients throughout the environment and for aeration of the water. Low turbidity is also important to ecosystem health because light energy is important for metabolic function of primary producers. Increased carbon dioxide levels leads to a decrease in pH, which then causes an increase in dissolved salts. The increase in dissolved salts then creates a hypertonic environment that leads to the loss of sensitive organisms. Solubility of salts and other charged particles in the water increases the conductivity, which is indicative of increased pollution. An increase in carbon dioxide also leads to an increase in algal blooms since it is the primary reservoir of organic carbon for aquatic plants. Inorganic nutrients enter aquatic ecosystems as a result of agricultural runoff, leaking or overflowing of septic tanks, deposition of animal wastes, and from car exhaust. Inorganic nutrients lead to an overgrowth of plants and plankton that causes a subsequent decrease in dissolved oxygen content because the corresponding algal blooms leads to a reduction in light penetration, which reduces the photosynthetic ability in other plants. Photosynthetic rates can also be reduced by an increase in turbidity that results from soil erosion. When flow rate is high, turbidity is high, and levels of inorganic nutrients are high, dissolved oxygen content will be low. If it reaches critically low levels, the support of life becomes very limited, leading to a massive decrease in biodiversity. For these reasons, dissolved oxygen content is one of the strongest indicators of ecological health. However, it does not point to the causes of ecosystem degradation. Therefore, other indicators of ecosystem health are considered equally important. 
The presence of fecal bacteria is indicative of pathogenic microorganisms that affect susceptible organisms, negatively affecting the biodiversity, biodiversity of benthic flora and fauna. Pathogens also have adverse human health effects. Have you ever had the water in Mexico? All of these factors directly or indirectly affect the biodiversity and water quality of the ecosystem and provide insights into the ecological integrity of the ecosystem and its health. It is important to measure as many of these parameters as possible so that sources of disturbance can be identified. This information makes it possible to formulate the strongest plan of action for repairing or maintaining the health of the ecosystem. Cochrane's Mill is an urban stream ecosystem located in Palmetto, Georgia that is fed by the Chattahoochee River, which runs through heavily urbanized regions of the state. We are particularly interested in monitoring Cochrane's Mill because urban development is expected to spread rapidly in this area in the future, which would severely and negatively impact the health of the ecosystem. Problems are expected to arise following the loss of root systems, stabilizing the soil, leading to increased runoff of nutrients into the water systems. This sediment is likely to elevate the nitrate and phosphate levels in addition to the installation of septic tanks that have the potential to leak. The subsequent erosion following removal of trees and cutting into the ground could lead to increased turbidity. All of these factors would decrease the integrity of the ecosystem and diminish the overall health. When examining Cochrane's mill, eco ecological stability and resilience cannot be fully evaluated with one set of data and we will require further sampling in the future. However, ecological integrity can be approximated for this particular ecosystem by examining the presence of macroinvertebrates because biodiversity is a key component of ecological integrity. The purpose of this project is to determine a baseline health measurement for this ecosystem. The goal is to develop a feasible strategy for monitoring the health of Cochrane's mill ecosystem and to formulate a plan to repair or maintain the health of the ecosystem based on our results. In order to achieve these goals, a replicable experimental pro protocol was developed to allow for non-experts to assess the health of the Cochrane's mill ecosystem in the future. The Cochrane's mill ecosystem is part of the southern outer Piedmont region of Georgia. This region has lower elevations and less precipitation than the mountainous regions to the north. The forest type is characterized by an abundance of loblolly pines and is dominated by granite, gneiss, and schist rock beneath a rich clay subsoil. An approximately 1,080-foot stretch of the stream at Cochrane's Mill was divided into three 360-foot segments. Each segment was subdivided into six test sites separated by 60 feet along the length of the stream. In total, 18 samples were taken from the stream. The first six sites were labeled as the top of the stream, sites 7 through 12, the middle, sites 13 through 18, the bottom. At each site, two 50 milliliter samples of water were obtained and stored on ice to be brought back to the lab for further chemical analysis. In order to develop a plan to continue to monitor this ecosystem in the future that is both cost effective and feasible, we decided to measure the following indicators of ecosystem health. Flow rate, turbidity, pH, levels of inorganic nutrients, dissolved oxygen content, the presence of fecal bacteria, and presence of benthic invertebrates. On site, flow rate was measured for each location using a weighted flow meter. Turbidity measurements were recorded using a Secchi disc, which was lowered into the water until it was no longer visible. The pH was measured for each sample using color fast pH indicator strips. Nitrate, phosphate, and dissolved oxygen levels were measured according to manufacturer's instructions for each sample. Each sample was also analyzed for the presence of fecal bacteria using a fecal coliform test in which sample is added to the culture media specific for the growth of fecal bacteria. The formation of an air bubble indicates that fecal bacteria are respiring and are therefore present. For the bottom region, benthic invertebrates were identified in order to calculate a pollution tolerance index based on their classification as sensitive, somewhat tolerant, or tolerant. A numerical score was calculated based on the presence or absence of specific species in our survey. Benthic invertebrates were typically located under rocks in the water and on the banks of the stream. In total, 90 rocks were surveyed for benthic invertebrates. Classification of the ecosystem as being poor, fair, good, or excellent health was determined by numerical population tolerance index scores of less than 10, 10 to 16, 17 to 23, and greater than 23, respectively. Flow rate measurements ranged from 0 cm per second to 15.43 cm per second and were grouped according to general flow rate. No flow sites were designated as those sites with a flow rate of 0 cm per second. Low flow sites were designated as those sites with a flow rate between 0 and 1 cm per second. Medium flow sites were designated as those sites with a flow rate between 1 and 10 cm per second. High flow sites were designated as those sites with a flow rate greater than 10 cm per second. In total, four sites were designated as no flow, six sites were designated as low flow, four sites were designated as medium flow, and four sites were designated as high flow. 
Measurements for turbidity, nitrates, phosphates, dissolved oxygen, and pH were grouped according to flow rate. Turbidity tended to increase with flow rate, which would make sense if faster moving water is displacing more soil than slower moving water. However, there was not significant variation amongst the groups. No turbidity data was measured for medium flow sites because none of those sites were deep enough to lose sight of the Secchi disk. For all turbidity measures, lower metric values correspond to higher turbidity. pH levels were relatively constant throughout the stream at 6, plus or minus 1. There is a considerable degree of random error in this value due to the difficulty in discerning color matches in the pH strips. Nitrate and phosphate levels range from 1 mg to 5 mg per liter, and from 1 mg to 10 mg per liter respectively, and were within historical ranges. Because the minimum threshold of the nitrate and phosphate test kits were 1 mg per liter, recorded nitrate and phosphate levels are considered to be maximum threshold values, not necessarily actual values. A calibration curve for dissolved oxygen was constructed by comparing experimental values of dissolved oxygen to known EPA standards for tap water at 22 degrees Celsius. This calibration curve was used to correct for systematic error in the dissolved oxygen test kit. Dissolved oxygen levels ranged from 7.07 .07 to 16.26 mg per liter and were within historical ranges. Because temperature was not recorded for each sample, samples were assumed to be within 5 degrees Celsius of room temperature, which was for, accounted for in error values. Fecal coliform tests were positive for the presence of fecal bacteria in all samples. The stream quality was determined to be good with a pollution tolerance index value of 19. Based on our experimental results, we feel that the ecosystem at Cochrane's Mill is healthy. Flow rate data was used for grouping purposes only and was not an indicator of health nor was turbidity. In a study conducted on streams of the southern outer Piedmont in 1998, pH values, nitrate levels, phosphate levels, and dissolved oxygen values were all within normal ranges. At the time of the study, the data collected indicated a healthy ecosystem for this region. The pH, nitrate, phosphate, and dissolved oxygen levels measured in our experimental support are claimed that the stream at Cochrane's Mill is healthy. The presence of fecal bacteria indicates that there is at least some level of contamination in the water. However, the tests were not qualitative and because the chemical data and the benthic invertebrate data indicated good health in the stream. We do not believe that the fecal bacteria data is sufficient enough to deem the ecosystem unhealthy. It is important to note that values representative of a healthy southern Piedmont stream are not the same values for streams in different regions. When considering the health of an ecosystem, it is important to take into account climate and environmental conditions. Since this ecosystem is in good health, preventative rather than curative measures are needed. Cochrane's Mill Park currently allows for primitive camping. Since this could be a potential source of pollution, it is suggested that this option be eliminated in order to protect the health of the ecosystem. However, if primitive camping cannot be prohibited, it is suggested that educational signs be posted to raise ecological awareness and encourage respect for nature. We would also like to establish a law that requires developers and builders to maintain a certain portion of the stream for every acre they develop. The developers would be required to maintain a riparian zone of 75 feet on either side of their segment of the stream in order to reduce the risk of soil erosion and increase turbidity. We also intend to educate the public through billboards, commercials, and public service announcements in the proper disposal of wastes and harmful materials, such as pesticides, batteries, trash, and fuel exhausts. It is our hope that by doing so, we can greatly reduce the input of pollutants such as inorganic nutrients and animal wastes that lead to decreases in biodiversity and loss of ecosystem integrity. Further urban development is expected, and to combat issues that could be raised by this change, we propose stricter regulations on companies involved in water treatment and building development. We predict that in 20 years, the health of the stream will decline if our programs for maintaining the integrity of the ecosystem are not implemented. This would result from the spreading of urbanization into this region of Georgia that would increase the incidence of soil erosion and introduction of pollutants into the water systems. The net effect would be a decrease in biodiversity and in the overall health of the ecosystem. However, if our plans are carried out successfully, we believe that the integrity of the ecosystem will remain the same and possibly improve over the course of 20 years. To verify the health of the ecosystem in the future, we intend to run all of the described tests seasonally. Results should be reported to a central agency and analyzed to determine how the health of the ecosystem is progressing. Should the health of the ecosystem decline, further study will be needed to identify the source of the change and further planning will be needed to rectify the situation.